Um, would you like to come back to that? Or any of you? I would. Audrey, yes. I well, there's so. a sense in which I think the narrative, or this is our popular word today, <laughs> um, the, the story of one's values is also very relevant to the American people. The, the panel that we had yesterday about the homegrown threat and the degree to which um, we need to develop a resilience in the United States, I think it's, it's very important to be thinking through the fact that if there is another attack, God forbid, that we have to think beyond um, the, the horror of the actual attack, if it's a several dozen people or however number of people it is, into the fact that we're a very resilient society with very robust values, with, bus, with, with a kind of a strength of character that will continue to um, move on beyond that point and to stop having a zero w risk um, mentality about um, you know, w what it is that we're facing. If, if every single time there's a potential attack, there is so much um, glorification even of a failed underwear bomber that you're beginning to draw people to him as a kind of a hero, then that ties into what, what you were saying about, about values and also about the question of being a hero. You know, it, it causes a kind of a false sense of brittleness among our own population and an inability to understand that sometimes risk is unavoidable. And the important thing is to move beyond the risk and to have an understanding that the day after, we'll still be able to do something very powerful and we'll still be ourselves. Thank you. Now, Please raise your hand if you have any questions. Um, we'll come to Sebastian in a second. We'll start with you, gentlemen. Please wait for the microphone and please state your name. Oh, my. And if you have any institution, oh, please name that. Oh, too. Uh, Mahmoud Saikal from Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was really, I must thank the panelists for giving us an excellent presentation. But what I was surprised with, that the analysis were made at individual and at most group level. Mm -hmm. um, in the case of Afghanistan, what we have is this state sponsorship and orchestration of terror. Uh, I think it's widely documented now that there are elements within the military of Pakistan who have been supporting terror for a lengthy period of time. We're talking of hundreds of suicide waistcoats being produced as if in a factory. We're talking of safe havens on the other side of the Duran line. We're talking of supply of arms continuously for a conventional warfare, not for an, an act of an individual coming to Kabul and committing a suicide attack. So um, uh, I, I'm interested to, to hear some comments from the panelists that, you know, uh, on the state sponsorship of terror. Thank you. At, at, at the other end of it, at, yes. the, at the counter terrorism end of it, we heard Peter Galbraith last night that how the resources have been abused for political struggle, for, political, for grabbing the political power in Afghanistan. Um, and it looks like at this, we've got state problems at this end as well. The fact that deliberately we do not act on institutionalization, on democratization, on rule of law, trying to strengthen our own positions to make sure that we do remain in power. So these are the two other ends that I hope the panelists could focus on. Thank and we'll you. bring that in. Thank you very much. Can I bring in Richard Barrett now, who had a question, I think, and uh, uh, also ask him, because he's a very well-informed man, um, to what extent terror and insurgency in Afghanistan is being driven by Pakistan? Uh, well, that's uh, I, I don't particularly relish answering the second part. Um, but I did, what I did want to ask the, this panel, uh, as Professor Kurt Cronin, Cronin um, said that the most normal way for terrorism to end is in failure. Uh, the Taliban don't look like failing in any time soon, and I just wondered what people thought would bring about the end of the insurgency, terrorism, whatever you want to call it, in Afghanistan. I mean, clearly outside factors, yeah, I mean, surely, um, play a part. But uh, fundamentally, this is an Afghan problem, and it would be very interesting to hear, obviously, from Michael and Hekmat, but also from the other panelists. Thank you. Michael, would you like to have a first stab? Afghanistan is, of course, full of the Afghan version of the urban myth. 
uh, one of the, the most popular uh, enduring urban myths um, which is started to pop up again in Afghanistan tells the, uh, the story of sort of eight or nine um, state-sponsored terrorists who cross the border uh, from Pakistan into Afghanistan. Uh, they uh, are directed by their sort of state sponsor um, uh, towards one of Afghanistan's reservoirs. Uh, they're told to you know, now blow it up and to destroy it. Um, and then in a fit of Afghan nationalism, they turn around and instead of blowing up the reservoir, uh, they uh, destroy the, um, the ISI military advisor who's been telling them to do it. It's, a, it's, a, it's an urban myth, but it's been widely circulated. It was told at various times during the, uh, the late 80s, early 90s, um, and it started to be told again now. Of course, it's a myth. However, it does tell us something about the problem. That yes, of course, I mean, it, you know, I don't need to make statements on, you know, on the record now about quite what is the nature um, of the support there, but there's all sorts of documentation of the way that um, you know, some, some people in the security establishment you know, want to invest in persuading Afghans to fight against the government. But the point is, uh, the Afghans who are there um, you know, have to take the decision whether they participate or not. Uh, and that's large, you know, some of it comes down to the, um, the in, you know, individual issues, the particular group, the particular commander, and some of it comes down to the state of the conflict in Afghanistan as history, history moves on. Um, so, yes, there is state sponsorship, but actually the, the factors inside Afghanistan are uh, extremely important as to whether that sponsorship is effective in persuading people to, uh, to carry on the fight or not. Um, and, of course, I mean, I, you know, I, just, I can only agree with also what Cycle Sab said, that uh, in, as, we, as we understand how we got to the current state of militancy in Afghanistan, where, you know, the combined forces of the world are not managed to pin it down. Of course, in the early stages of this current insurgency, where people had to make a decision as to whether they integrated into the process which was getting going in 2000, in the end of 2001 and onwards, or they went over to Pakistan and ultimately joined the insurgency, one decisive factor uh, was abuses carried out by uh, people, in the, uh, people in the new administration, who basically persecuted rather than welcoming these people. There was a failure of long-term thinking about how to incorporate the, the, the militants from the previous regime into the new regime as we set up. And very, very, very briefly on the um, Richard's uh, question how about how, it it's, yeah, to how, it's going to, how it's going to uh, end in, in Afghanistan, you know, guess what? Um, uh, I think that it's, um, it's unlikely that it is going to end in uh, the you know, successful, you know, the Taliban fight their way into Kabul, alongside the reasons why they're not going to be able to do that. Uh, it's unlikely to end in simple failure, whereby they, uh, they peter out. Um, it's more likely to end in, you know, in some kind of uh, agreement accommodation, but there is a question of what is the time frame for that happening. Uh, probably, given exactly what Richard is pointing to, that they, the current state of the military campaign, the Taliban are not about to, uh, to drop their weapons just now and enter into a deal. And there's, going to be, uh, there's going to be a protracted period where they reevaluate their options based upon the viability of the, uh, the system in Kabul, and they ultimately realize that you know, they, the, the best thing which is open to them is to uh, accommodate with the, uh, the setup which is there as Kabul and to pursue, uh, pursue the various routes towards a somewhat normal, peaceful future, which absolutely is possible. And multiple generations of militants in Afghanistan have, tro have trod that route. We have documented many of them and now have to wait for the Taliban to choose to tread that route. Egmont, you also said you had an answer to the question. Well, there were three questions. So I'll, I'll yes. Richard. I think uh, Michael answered it the other. Uh, sooner or later, we have to move towards the direction of political settlement. We've been saying this all along that, you know, uh, the way things are going, uh, it's only going to further destabilize the situation. The reality at this stage is that how we're going about dealing towards that political settlement is very contradictory. The United States has this policy that, you know, first we cannot negotiate, and then if you're going to negotiate, you have to negotiate from position of strength. But how do you define that position of strength? How do you take away the momentum of a group that is controlling more and more areas? And at the same time, I mean, you have over 40 different countries, but they seem to cannot get, a, they can't agree on, you know, a comprehensive approach in that direction. So my 
response really to that is the end state really is a political settlement, but as soon as we come to a rationalization of how to go about doing it, we'll save a lot of time, a lot of resources, uh, and significantly lots of lives.